So Numbers chapter 18. It's always important in our lives that we know where we belong. Not knowing where you belong can be a lonely and dangerous place to be. For example, if you find yourself working in a trade that you don't belong. I remember I, we were, I, I was off work for a while and my, uh, my landlord was looking for rent. And I said to him, I, I don't have work. Shauna was working part-time and we just didn't have that much. I said, I can give you a little bit, but I can't pay rent. And, and I, I don't know what we're going to do, you know, because there, there wasn't very much work at the time. This was like 20 years ago. And it was just like, I, I don't know what we're going to do. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'm building a house. You come and work with me and I'll pay, your, your pay will be the rent. And I was like, oh, okay. So I, so I showed up the first day. Now you got to understand, I'm like 21, 22 years old. I had never worked on a construction site like that where they were actually expecting me to do framing. And he walks up and hands me this giant power nailer. Um, and this was a battery powered one and it weighed like 100 pounds. It was like this big. He hands it to me and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. And he goes, okay, so we're gonna start you know, framing up. So just grab that and start nailing those two by fours together. And I'm like, whoa, this is dangerous. So I did a couple things and then the other guy came and took the nailer away and got me to hold the wood while he nailed. Um, but if you are in the wrong place, especially when it comes to trades or something, you can do a lot of damage. You can do damage to yourself and to others. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know there wasn't a safety on here. Um, you can do a lot of damage. And at the same time, it can be really lonely. There can be a lot of pain and suffering if you're, doing, if you're in the wrong place. And over the last few weeks, we have seen a confused nation not knowing where they belong. They are the people of promise. The promise and presence of God were what defined them. That's what made them a nation was that promise that they had of the promised land. And their relationship with the Lord is what made them a nation. But they lost sight. They lost sight of that in fear and, in, and doubt. Oh, there's giants in the land. We're going to get consumed. They're going to eat us. They're going to crush us like grasshoppers. We're all going to die. And then they began to question they began to question the leadership. Oh, Mer Moses and Aaron, you take too much upon yourselves. Who made you the leaders? They began to question them and say, hey, we can do your job. We can be there. We can do your job. Have you ever been elevated to a position you were not equipped or ready for? It is a scary thing. If you get a promotion at work and you don't know what you're doing, that's a scary thing. And I, I've known lots of people who've said, yeah, I got a promotion, but I have no idea what I'm doing. It's scary. You're kind of like, uh, I think you made a mistake. I think you picked the wrong guy. I have no idea what you expect me to do. I remember one time I was working a job and they said, okay, we want you to do more stuff in, your, in the office and doing like spreadsheets and stuff. And I literally sat in front of the computer and was like, okay, how do you open a spreadsheet? I think you picked the wrong guy to do this job. You know, I learned, but it took a long time and it was a mess. They're like, you know, you can actually do formulas, right? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I was individually punching every number in. Um, you know, y y it can be a mess. It can be devastating. It can be scary. These men said, hey, we should be allowed to enter the tabernacle and do the job of the priests. The job of the sons of Aaron. But yet, you know what? They thought they could lead the nation, but they were wrong. They were dead wrong. So wrong that they were swallowed up and consumed by fire from the altar. And God showed them who he had called and ordained to lead the people when Aaron's rod budded and blossomed and, and produced fruit. The people responded then in fear. In fear. Oh, we're all going to die. If we go anywhere near the tabernacle, we're going to die. Nobody may, may approach. We can't go near. They missed the point. God was saying, there is a way to approach me and you have to come through the way. You can't just do it your own way. You can't just pick your own way. Our world today says that. You, anyway, every, all, all roads lead. You go anyway, whatever you want. It's like, no. There is a way 
to the Lord, and that's through Jesus Christ. So here in chapter 8, 18, we're going to see how the Lord here in chapter 18 is going to bring them back. Bring them back to where they belong. Get them back into the right place where they belong. He starts off here, says, Then the Lord said to Aaron, You and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear the iniquity related to the sanctuary, and you and your sons with you shall bear the iniquity associated with the priesthood. The Lord reconfirms their calling. That Aaron and his sons were to be the ones who were to serve before the Lord in the tabernacle. And they were to bear the iniquity. What does that mean? They were to bear the responsibility. They were responsible for everything that took place in and around the tabernacle. It was their job to take care of things. They couldn't just go around doing their day going, well, I don't really, it doesn't make a difference what happens. No, they had to keep their eyes out. They had to pay attention. They had to take care of the things of the tabernacle. They had great responsibility upon their shoulders. Verse 2, it says, Also bring with you your brethren of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your fathers, that they may be joined with you and serve, serve you while you, you and your sons are with you before the tabernacle of witness. So now he says, hey, bring the other Levites. The other Levites were there to serve. You see, the other Levites were all upset a chapter or so ago because they wanted to be in charge. They wanted to go and do the work of the, of the priests, of the family of Aaron. They wanted to do that, but they forgot that their job was to support them. Their job was to make sure that they have everything they need to do their job. They had a very important job. So the Lord says, hey, Aaron and your sons, you guys get back to what you're supposed to be doing. Levites, you guys come too. You got to get back to what you were supposed to be doing. The area that they were to be ministering in. They were to be the support team. And it was so important because Aaron and them, we, we've been looking at it as we've gone through here, they had a lot of work to do. There was a lot of sacrifices, a lot of procedures, a lot of things to go on. And they needed the support team to keep them going. Verse 3, it says, They shall attend to the needs and all the needs of the tabernacle, but they shall not come near the articles of the sanctuary and the altar, lest they die, they and you also. They were to take care of the needs, but they were not to enter into the tabernacle. That was the, that was the job of Aaron and his sons. Their job was to take care of everything inside the tabernacle. The other guys were to take care of everything on the outside. They were the support team, and they were not to go in. They were to take care of, this, of the service for each and every day. And we see this in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, chapter 6, as the church appointed seven men full of the Holy Spirit to take care of the practical needs of the church. The church was growing, things were pretty busy, and there were, began a dispute between the Hellenist Jews and the... Um, the Hellenist Jews and the Hebrew Jews, which were ones that would slant towards more towards a Greek lifestyle and ones that were more traditional, there began to be an a, 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 a argument that one was being taken care of more than the other. And, and these things were happening, and, and the apostles looked out and said, well, we can't take care of all of this and teach the word and be in prayer and do all the ministry, so we need to appoint some guys who are godly men to take care of this practical work of literally handing out food, serving tables, waiting tables. And so they picked these godly men who were full of the Holy Spirit to do the practical work of the church. That the pastors could take care of the spiritual needs concerning prayer and the word of God. This doesn't mean that the role of a deacon is demeaned, that it's lower, but shows the importance of the support staff that's needed. They were to work together so that the word of God could go forth. We just came back from this wonderful time in Calgary at RMCC. They held the retreat at the church. And let's just say they slapped this thing together. Because they weren't sure if they could. They were trying to figure out all the... At first they were talking about having it in We actually talked about having it here and then in Fernie. And they were trying to figure out how to do this. Where can we meet? Where will it work with the regulations? And it literally was just slapped together really fast. But I'll tell you something. You couldn't tell. It was done really well. I think it was more organized than when we've been at the camps. 
We've had it in camps and retreat centers in the past. It was very organized. It was just a very well set up. Yeah. Because everyone's gifts were used. It was amazing. Everything was taken care of. Things were happening behind the scenes. It was amazing how everything came together. And, and it showed us how important that support staff is. To have those people that are, that are behind you and lifting you up and, and preparing things so that you can do the work that, uh, that needs to be done. Verse 4, verse 4 it says, They shall be joined with you and attend to the needs of the tabernacle meeting for all the work of the tabernacle. But an outsider shall not come near. They were to be joined in service, but they were also to know their place. They were to know their place and their calling. They had to be aware of where they belonged. And I've talked about this before. We have to be aware of where we belong. So we may be serving and helping up, setting up chairs, doing the book table, whatever it might be, putting the signs out, doing whatever. But then if we walk up here and grab the mic, and everybody else is like, okay, I've come out, then you've come out of your gifting and gone to where you're not supposed to go. Or I could, well, Kevin was going to do it for me. We, I wish we had done that. That would have been funny. Um, we were going to bring his bagpipes. And when I, because I did a session of worship with a bunch of the pastor's wives doing, playing instruments and stuff and singing but we were going to bring the bagpipes so I could walk up on stage with them and just kind of do a couple squirts at like, like I'm killing a cat. And they'd all be like, oh no, Steve, no, no. Um, it was bad enough because they were a little confused that I got up and I went up and picked up the mic and they said, what's Steve doing up there? <laughs> yeah, yeah it, was, it wasn't very encouraging, I don't think. But it was a good time. But if we step outside of our calling, we can make a mess. We can make a mess. They had to be aware of where they belonged. What was their calling? What was their gifting? And keep the people from wandering where they did not belong. It was their job to keep the people from going where they didn't belong. And you know, that's a lot of times what ministry is. When we see a brother or sister wandering in an area they shouldn't be, we can pull them aside and say, hey, you're going the wrong way. That's going to lead to sin. That's going to lead to destruction. That's going to lead to hurt and pain. You need to come. You need to go the right way. You need to be where you belong. Verse 5, And you shall attend to the duties of the sanctuary and to the duties of the altar, that there may be no more wrath on the children of Israel. You need to attend to the things that you were called to do and take care of the people and teach them so that there will not be any wrath upon the children of Israel. It's funny because when I was studying, this verse came to mind. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 came to my mind. This is one of those pastoral verses. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. That's one of those verses that if you're in the ministry, you go, whoop. Watch out for your souls and we have to give account? Okay. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. This is one of those verses that you go, oh yeah. The first half you go, oh. Go. And the second half you go, yeah. Don't make my life miserable because it's not going to turn out good for you. And then here he's saying to the priests, hey, you guys got to do the work of the sanctuary. You got to do the work you're called to do so that the wrath of God doesn't come upon these people. You need to teach them. Don't go that way. That's bad. Don't do that. Stay away from this. Avoid this. These are the things that God is teaching you. As a pastor, a pastor is an under shepherd, uh, under, shepherd under Jesus Christ, and he is to take care of the flock. Just like the priests were to take care of the people and to teach them and protect them from the wrath of God being poured out. From making the wrong decisions. And the Levites were responsible for the iniquity that took place in and around the tabernacle. And they were to teach the people how to walk and how to serve the Lord. Verse 6 it says, Behold, I myself have taken you, brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel... They are a gift to you, give, given by the Lord to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. 
God reminds them again that he chose them to be the family to serve in the tabernacle as a gift to the people. As a gift to the people. They were to serve the people and stand before the Lord. They were to be teaching the people the things and the ways of God. How to walk, how to talk. Without the priesthood the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, they could not approach God. They could not approach him without the priesthood. They needed the priesthood. Here's a question today. Who's the priesthood today? All of us. We're a royal priesthood. We can boldly come before the Lord and serve. He's called us all to serve before the Lord. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful that we can come before him and, and serve him. We can approach. No longer do we have to go through a priest now Anybody who's grown up with the Catholic background, they teach you you have to go through the priest or Mary or somebody else to get to Jesus. No, no, we can boldly approach Jesus. We can boldly go before the throne and, and bring our prayers and our offerings before him. It's beautiful and it's wonderful. And that's what the Lord did when he died upon the cross. He brought us in. Verse 7, therefore you and your sons... You with, uh, um, sons with you shall attend to the priesthood for everything at the altar and behind the veil, and you shall serve. I will give, uh, or I give your priesthood to you as a gift for service. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Now, I just want to make sure we understand it. The priesthood was who? The family of Aaron. So Aaron and his sons were the priesthood, and the Levites were assistants. They were the servants. They would come and serve. So the Levite, the, the other Levites were not to go in. And that's why when the other guys, when Korah and them said, hey, they grabbed their incense pots and said, hey, we want to come before. They were not supposed to have the incense pots and they were not supposed to be going in. It was just for Aaron and his sons. They, they overstepped their bounds. And God has placed these these uh, positions for them as a gift for service. But they were to keep the outsiders out, lest they be put to death. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, Here, I myself also have given you charge of my, uh, of my um, heave offerings, all the holy gifts of the children of Israel. I've given them as a portion to you and your sons, as an ordinance forever. This shall be yours of the most holy things reserved for fire, every offering of theirs, every grain offering, every sin offering, every trespass offering, which they render to me, shall be most holy for you and your sons. In a most holy place you shall eat it. Every male shall eat it. It shall be holy to you. This, this also is yours, the heave offering of, the, of their gift, with all the wave offerings of the children of Israel. I have given them to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat of it. God God's chose, chose them to serve before the Lord in the tabernacle. This is a very big responsibility and a lot of heavy work. Taking a heave offering of an in, entire uh, back section of a cow and lifting up over your head and waving it before the Lord. That's a lot of work, not to mention butchering the cow. And they were doing this repeatedly all day long. And you know what? God re reminds them here, I called you and I will take care of you. I've called you in the service, into the service, but I'm also going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. They were given a portion of each sacrifice that came uh, from the children of Israel. So of all the sacrifices, the only sacrifice they didn't take a portion from was which one? Quiz question. I know they're complicated. The burnt offering. The burnt offering all was consumed. The sin offering, they took one. The trespass offering, they took something. The grain offerings, they took something. The fellowship offerings, they took a piece. All the other offerings, they got a portion of it to feed their families. And verse 12, it continues, it says, All the best of the oil, all the best of new wine and the grain, their first fruits, which they offered to the Lord, I have given them to you. 
whatever first first ripe fruit is in the land which you, which they bring to the Lord shall be yours everyone who is clean in your house may eat of it every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours everything that that first opens the womb of a, of all flesh which which they bring to the Lord whether man or beast shall be yours nevertheless the firstborn firstborn of man shall be surely redeemed and the firstborn of unclean animals shall be redeemed and those redeemed of the devoted things shall you shall redeem when one month when one month old according to the valuation for five shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary which is 20 geras God not only took care of their needs but he gave them the best he gave them the best he made sure they take it's not like hey we're going to just give you what's left over you know, there's some, there's some, you know, goat's legs in that bucket over there. You, you can take those home. And sometimes that's how it ends up being in the ministry, is that people think, hey, well, we'll just give them the left, the last, and the whatever's left. I, I always um, talk about this, that there were times, um, you know, we've never really had that here at the church. Once in a while, people will ask, uh, they'll say, hey, can I donate something to the church? And you kind of go, after my experience, I go, what? Can I donate this couch? Why? Well, it's been in the carport for six years and the cats have been sleeping on it, but we don't really need it anymore. So I want to donate it to the church. And I remember when we had the other building, I got a lot of those. I had someone who said, we want to donate an organ. It was a big organ. It was a nice organ, but it was really large. And they said, here's the trick. It's in our, pa our parents' basement. And you got to come get it. And I was going, well, first of all, I got nobody who plays organ. Second of all, I don't want to move this thing. And third of all, who am I going to trick into moving it? Right? It's like, this isn't going to work. That was before Kevin was here. Yeah. <laughs> if Kevin was here, I would have taken it. No, I'm just kidding. You know, it's like, I, told, I think I've told the story about how we got our first TV. I was at work and... This guy called and says, I want to donate a TV to the church for the children's ministry. So the guy, my boss says, hey, Steve, I need you to go pick up this TV. So I went and picked it up. And, and it was in this guy's garage. And it's this big wooden TV with the speakers on each side. It was 27-inch TV. Or no, maybe it was smaller than that. It was pretty small. But, but it was massive and it weighed a billion pounds. And I said, oh, so why are you donating this? And he says, well, it doesn't work. I was like... What? It was, well, it doesn't work. And I got a new one. So he takes me in his living room and he's got like this. Now this is back in the 90s. He has this giant, you know, re uh, reverse projection screen thing. Big, giant, massive thing. Surround sound, massive, big house. And I'm kind of going, oh, well, thank you. So I called my boss. I pulled over and used a pay phone. He put quarters in them. Yeah, okay. And... Uh, <laughs> I called my boss. I said, what do I do? He goes, well, leave it in the truck. It's too late tonight. And then tomorrow, take it to the dump or whatever, you know. And so, I, so on, the, on the way home, I thought to myself, I wonder if I can get it working. So I brought it home. And on the way home, I stopped and bought batteries for the remote control. So I sat it in the garage. I plugged it in, went dunk. And it worked fine. And we had it for over 10, 12 years. Because we had it in my parents' living room, and then we had it after we got married for years. Until one day it went, pew. Um, but it, it, the remote control battery was dead. But that, that's the point. It's like, you know, you don't give the, the well, this is not working, so I'm going to donate it to the church. No, that's not. That's not. You're supposed to, they, they were to get the best. They were to get the best, and they were to be taken care of. And then he talks about redeeming here. And, of course, we've already talked about this, but when... Uh, when your child, when your firstborn child was born, you were to dedicate it to the, to the tabernacle. Well, of course, they're not going to take your child and, you know, hey, you, hey, we got another kid. No, you would pay. You would pay a portion to redeem them because they belong to the Lord. And, you, and so you could keep your child. You pay this portion to the church. The same thing for uh, certain animals. If you had a, a donkey or a goat or, or a horse or whatever, a camel. I don't think they had camels. No, they were unclean. That whatever animal they had, a work animal, an oxen, and they, and they were to give it to the Lord because it was a firstborn of their new herd of oxen, they could actually pay a portion to redeem that animal to keep it in their flocks. And so the, the, um, the priests would get a portion of that. 
verse 17 it says, But the firstborn of the cow, the firstborn of the sheep, or the firstborn of a goat, you shall not redeem. They are holy. They sh you shall sprinkle their blood on the altar and burn their fat as an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. They weren't to redeem the cow or the sheep or the goat as they were, a they were to be a sacrifice, a blood, a blood sacrifice to be sprinkled upon the altar. And they would receive a portion of the meat for their family. And in the New Testament, we read that those who minister in the church should be taken care of as well. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9 says, For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it, it, it altogether for our sake? For our sake, no doubt. This is written that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes, threshes in hope should be partaker of this hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, it is, a, it is, it, is it a great thing if we reap material things? I always thought, you know, when I read this, I'm like, thanks a lot that the Lord compares ministers of the Lord to oxen. It's like big, burly. <clears throat> and I, I always thought that was interesting, but then, you know, being in the ministry for years, yeah, it kind of is. You just kind of put your head down and... <clears throat> plow through, keep going. Um, but it's interesting. The Lord takes care of those who serve him. And their flesh shall be yours, just as the wave, wave breast, uh, just as the wave breast and the right thigh are yours. All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer to the Lord I have given to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord with you and your descendants with you. So we, we're reading away here about these offerings. We're like, okay, so the priests get a portion. And then the Lord says, it's a covenant of salt between you guys, between me and you. And you go, a covenant of salt? What is that? What does that mean? Well, salt is a preserving agent. Salt also isn't consumed by fire. It's something that's everlasting. It lasts forever. We consume it and it comes through our system and out the other end. It's just there. It's a mineral. But salt is an everlasting and it was a symbol of an everlasting covenant. It was a symbol of that blessing that was to preserve and take care of and continue on forever. It's interesting because the Roman soldiers were given a salarium, which a part of their pay was they were given salt which they could use to preserve their food, to take care of wounds, to do all kinds of things. They were given, and salt could be traded. It was very valuable. But it's interesting because from that word, we get our word salary. It was part of their pay that they depended upon. They were given a regular stipend of salt as their pay, which is just an interesting side note there. Um, verse 20, it says, Then the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land. Nor shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the children of Israel. So the priests were given all of these blessings. Of course, they had all this responsibility as well. And then the Lord says, hey, when you guys come into the land of promise, you don't get an inheritance. Yeah, you're like, what? Everybody else is all excited about all this land flowing with milk and honey and we don't get an inheritance? And the Lord says, I am your portion. I will be your inheritance. I will be the portion, your inheritance among the children of Israel. They were given something so special and so wonderful because they were going to serve before the Lord. They were given a connection with the Lord. Now as they entered into the promised land, they did build cities of the Levites, but they didn't own the land. They were just living on it. They didn't own the land. It didn't belong to them. They were just living there and those cities became the cities of refuge where those who were in trouble or whatever could run to and be safe. So when you weren't serving as a priest, because again, after hundreds of years, there was lots of the children of Levi and children of Aaron. They would work in shifts and when they weren't working at the temple or the tabernacle, they would head back to their homes and farm and do whatever they could, but they didn't own the land. They were just on the land, and the Lord took care of them that way. 
Behold, verse 21, I have given the children of Israel all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance to return for the work which they perform, the work of a tabernacle of meeting. Hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. The rest of the nation was to approach the tabernacle, was not to approach the tabernacle, yes, they, lest they die. And they had already demonstrated their lack of faith in the Lord and in their rebellious hearts. So they're saying, you know what? Stay back. Now we remember how the camp was laid out. The Levites were camping all around the tabernacle. So there was a buffer zone. So if you saw anybody who wasn't a child of the Levi walking through, you'd be like, hey dude, you've gone too far. You do not, you do not want to approach. You've got to stay away. They had already shown their lack. So God here, for their safety, he forbid them from coming near. He's like, you know what, just to protect you guys, you guys aren't allowed to come anywhere near. You're to come and bring your offerings to the priests, and they will go in for you. They will bring it in. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that among the children of Israel they shall, not, they shall have no inheritance. For the tithes of the children of Israel shall... Tithes of the children of Israel, which they, have, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. As well as the sacrifice. So they got the sacrifice. So they have food to eat each, every day. But also the children of Israel were to bring a tenth percent of their increase. And they were to bring this offering, this tithe, unto the or unto the temple or tabernacle, and then uh, that was given to the priests as an income. So beyond the food, they were also given an income to take care of them. And today, today many argue over whether New Testament believers are to tithe or to give. I don't know if you guys have heard these arguments. They say, well, tithing is an Old Testament statute. Well, the first argument to that is Abraham tithed long before the law was ever put in place. And if you want to argue that's an Old Testament statute... If you look at the Old Testament tithe and all the temple tax and everything else they had to pay, it was like 23%. So they had to pay like a lot more than 10%. The word tithe simply means a tenth. And Abraham again gave a tenth unto Melchizedek back in Genesis. And let's look at it this way. When looking for how we ought to give unto the Lord, how about we start with the tenth? How about we start with a tenth and go from there? A tenth's not very much. If you consider $100, that's how much? Ten bucks. It's not very much. We go, wow, I can give more than that. We should start there. It should be our starting point that we jump off into when we're giving unto the Lord. And what the New Testament does not speak, does not speak about with great clarity on is the principle, or does speak about it with great clarity, is the principle of giving. That giving should be regular, planned, pro proportional, and private. That we should be planning ahead what we're going to give. That we should be putting, it should be put on our heart, and we need to give as a cheerful giver. Not with grudging and bemoaning. If you want to look, at, look that up, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 or 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And it talks all about that, that we shouldn't be coming grudgingly and feeling obligated and bemoaning it. It should be a cheerful thing. And I love how it says it too, that we're not to give it, we're to plan ahead. It says in 1 Corinthians that we're to plan ahead. And that's, I've heard lots of people say, well, I tithe based on the sermon. No, I've heard people say this. I, that was a good sermon today. Wink, wink, you're going to get a little extra. It's like, but that's not how it works. Well, yeah, it's like, well, that's good. Yeah, so I better dance a little bit more. And, you know, it's, but a lot of people, that's how they do it. They say, well, I'll see how I feel today. No, we're just to plan ahead and ask the Lord to put it on our heart. Lord, what do you want me to give and how am I to give it? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, verse 25, saying, Speak thus to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the children of Israel the tithes, which I have given you from them as the... As your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe, and your heave offering shall be reckoned to you as though it were the grain of the threshing floor and as, as the fullness of the winepress. So not only were they 
were the people to bring their offerings before the Lord, but yes, the leaders were to bring an offering, a tenth before the Lord to the tabernacle. Now, now I remember years ago when we had first started out, way back when, and uh, Adele's husband, a late husband, Len, he took over doing the books, and he called me one day and says, well, Steve, I'm looking at this, and I notice that you give regularly, but you're the leader, you don't have to give. He goes, in our other churches, the, the, the leader never gave because we're paying him. So it's silly for him to give the money back. And I was like, that's when I sat down and said, that's not what giving is about. Giving is a praise offering saying, thank you, Lord, for all that you've given me. And I want to give back. So whether you're a leader or somebody from the congregation, it's the same thing. And so you know what he says, because he's very logical, he goes, well, this is sweet. So when calculating wages, we can always consider that we're going to get at least 10% back. So we actually can say, we pay Steve this much, but it's actually this much because he's going to give this section back. And I was like, well, that's <laughs> it's just funny because he's like, so we can calculate it that way. I was like, yeah, that's, whatever. that's not how it works, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they were to give unto the Lord as well. And I know there are some denominations where they don't. You know, the, the pastors have this thing where they don't give, and I think that's wrong because the Lord calls for all of us to give. And here he says the leaders are to give back as well the money that they already got from the Lord. Verse 28, thus you shall also offer a heave offering to the Lord of, uh, from all your tithes which you receive from the children of Israel, and you shall give, the, give, to the Lord's, uh, give the Lord's heave offering from it to Aaron the priests. Of all your gifts you shall offer up every heave offering due to the Lord, for all the best of them, the consecrated parts of them. Therefore you shall say to them, when you have lifted up the best of it, then the rest shall be accounted to the Levites as the produce of the threshing floor and as the produce of the wine press. And you may eat it in a place, you and your, you and your household, for it is your reward for your work in the tabernacle of meeting. And you shall bear no sin, uh, sin because of it when you have lifted up the best of it, but you shall not profane the holy gifts of the children of Israel, lest you die. So now we come to the end of this chapter that gives us all this information. And the Lord here is bringing the people back into the order that they were to be in. Now, it's kind of amazing when we look at it. In, in, Leviticus, they, in, in Leviticus, they were established. In Exodus and Leviticus, they were established and placed into their position. They were brought together as a camp, as a people to serve the Lord. In Leviticus, they were given all the rules and regulations to guide them. And, 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 this, and it's not hasn't been very long since the Lord gave them the law. And now God's like, okay, guys, pay attention. Let's get back to the way it's supposed to be. This is how you're supposed to serve. And he's bringing them back around. And knowing where you belong brings much reward. When you know where you belong, when you know where you're you're supposed to be, it brings much reward. When the Levites were rebelling against God, they were consumed and destroyed. But when they said, Lord, what do you have for me to do and how? They were blessed. God took care of them. Took care of all of their needs. And in the body of Christ, we all have a place to be. We all have different gifts. We all have different talents. And as we work together, we are blessed and others are blessed as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to just turn there to finish off. Chapter 12, verse 12. We are part of the body of Christ. And just like the Levites had jobs to do, and a position to, to play and that the Lord would take care of them, the Lord has called us as the body of Christ to work together. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, it says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all, but all the members of that body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, And have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Now, sometimes we get up from watching a movie or something, and our foot does say, I'm not here. (laughs) I remember once I was at an assembly 
in high school, and we had to sit on the floor because there wasn't enough room for everybody to sit on the bleachers. And they called my name to come forward for something. And I was completely like, what? And I got up, and one of my legs decided that it was still sleeping. And I remember just kind of going, mm-hmm. <laughs> like dragging my leg up. Hi, guys. It's like, and you know that terrible tingling? Oh. Yeah, it's the worst. And you're standing in front of everybody going, hey, this is good. But just because your foot says, hey, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Sometimes we do this. We say, well, I'm not up there or I'm not doing this, so I guess I'm just not part of the body. No, we're all part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole, uh, whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker or, ne- or weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow great honor, and our un- and unpresentable parts have great, great modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which, uh, to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schisms in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Question mark. Are all prophets? Question mark. Are all teachers? Question mark. Are all workers of miracles? Question mark. Do you have gifts of healing? Do you speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you more excellent way. We all have, what Paul is trying to tell us is we all have giftings. God has called us all to be part of the body of Christ. And we all have giftings. Do we all have the same giftings? No. Is one gifting more important than the other? No. We can't say, well, I don't need you, foot. And then we try to start moving forward and we're dragging and falling all over the place. No, we all have to work together. And we all support each other. And so you might be saying, well, hey, you know, that's great and wonderful, but I don't know what my part is. I don't know what my calling is. I don't know what God wants me to do. Well, this is where you start. You start today and you say, you know what, okay, this is how I find out what my part is. I start by praying. I start by praying. You pray for every individual in our fellowship, write down their names in a list, take a photo. I, what I do is I take a photo of everybody in my brain, click, no, I take a photo of everybody where they sit usually, because you guys are pretty predictable, um, and then I can kind of work my way through. That's how I know when someone's not there, because my brain kind of goes through and goes, hey, there's a seat missing, so-and-so wasn't here, oh, they, they're not here, they're missing, Michelle's not here, Sandra, you know, I know who's, who's not here. Because I've got this picture. But take, or I also have lists. Write a list of everybody. Use your directory as a list as well. And pray through each person individually. Pray for them individually. Go through the list of each person. And then pray for our fellowship in general. general, And then pray for the other churches in our community. And then pray for our community. Pray for our province, especially right now. Pray for our province. Pray for our country. Pray for the world. And you know, as you spend time in prayer, when you listen to other people's needs and concerns and pray for those, the Lord is slowly going to show you what your gifts are. He's going to begin to move you into a place where you can serve. And He will guide you. And He'll show you what part of the body you are. And He will equip you for whatever you have to do. And you know what? If you just continue to pray... That's awesome. More prayer, the better. 
that's where the power comes. But as we continue to pray and we continue to find where the Lord has done in our life and the gifts that He's given us, then He will guide us. A body that's missing a part is disabled. Disabled. If you're missing a part, you're disabled. You're shaking your head, no. If you're missing an arm, you are disabled. Correct? Yeah. If you're missing a big toe, we were talking about that. If you miss a big toe, you are disabled. You've got to learn how to walk again. You can adapt, but you're not fully able. Now, we're not demeaning people who don't have an arm or a leg or foot, big toe. But you're disabled. That's why as the body of Christ, we want every part to be here and working. And that's why when I bump into people on the street and they say, well, I, I don't go to church anymore or I'm staying home for whatever reason or I watch online, I say, you are robbing the church of a piece, of a part. You're robbing the church, whether our church or somebody else's church, whatever church, you're robbing a part because you're not here active. We all know what it's like when a part checks out and just doesn't want to cooperate. We have to go to the chiropractor. We go to the doctor and say, you know, this finger hasn't moved in three days and it's turning purple. And the doctor says, well, I think we need to fix that. You know, we all know what that's like. And it's so it's important as a fellowship that we work together and that we find our part and that we are blessed in it. So I'll have a sign-up sheet for Sunday school in the back. Not kidding. But the Lord has something for each of us to do. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much. We thank you so much, Lord, that you work in our life, Lord God, that we are the body of Christ and that you knit us together. You bind us together and that we work together with our different gifts, different callings, different spiritual gifts, Lord God. You work through us. And Lord, that we would just be a light that shines forth from this place, that each and every one of us, Lord God, would just impact our community and those around us. Lord, we pray that your word would go forth this morning and just speak to our hearts, Lord, that we would know that you have a place for us to serve and you will equip us and you will take care of us and provide for us in that place, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.